Hi, I'm Reverend Kole Washo, and I'm glad you're willing to invest your time with us again. This is the second phase of our Laying Foundation series. It's a mentoring program. It's to help men especially to have the foundation in their lives. In the first one, we looked at Christ as our divine exchange. What do I mean by that? Yes, he came, he died. He was buried. He rose from the dead. And God is, is ascended unto the right hand of the Father right now. But what does it all mean to you? If that doesn't mean anything to you other than just the fact that it happened, then you have not labored to lay that foundation correctly. Because in laying the foundation, you remember, in this series of mentoring, our focus is on your personal development, your personal life, your personal appropriating of the principles of God's word and the principles of life that make for success. So that you can succeed. Because I've seen too many people, they have all the potentials, but they don't know what to do, how to engage themselves to succeed in life. And it's not rocket science. It's available. That's why we're doing this series. So today we're looking at the second phase, the second reason why Jesus came, and I call it divine exchange. Sorry, divine pattern. Divine exchange is the first one. Divine exchange, you need to get the outline or the scriptures that tell you what Christ did on your behalf so that you can become who God meant, meant, meant for you to be. In this divine pattern, there's a lot of difficulty that uh, people have here. And this is where the real process goes in. Because in divine exchange, you come in contact with a new identity. In divine exchange, you come in contact with a new authority. In divine exchange, you come in contact with the finished work of Calvary. You are now the righteousness of God in Christ. You are now accepted as a child of God. You are now welcome in the presence of God. Now, that acceptance can be equal, can be seen to be I'm accepted, so what do I need to do again? No, you're accepted because of the finished work of Calvary. You're accepted because the price has been paid. But now, for you to do and be all that God wants you to be and do, there's stuff inside you that needs to go. In James 1 from verse 21, it says that we should lay aside all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. And we should receive with meekness, the engrafted word, which is able to save our souls. So in this second phase of understanding, laying the foundations we call uh, divine pattern, we're looking at Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as a pattern. And what do I mean by that? That in your life, there will be things that would have to die. That in your life, there will be things that will have to be buried. In your life, there will be things that God himself will raise back with a new life. And that's the secret that a lot of people miss out. A lot of people go through it without understanding it. A lot of people go through it without explaining, being able to explain it to others. But I, I found it that it is there in the Word of God. And the, 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 the base scripture is the one found in John 12. When in John 12, Jesus said that except the grain of wheat falls down to the ground, the grain of corn falls down to the ground and dies, it abides alone. But when it dies, it brings forth much fruit. And he went on to talk about if you will love yourself and all of that, you won't be able to follow him. But if you will hate yourself and things like that. But the, the, the principle is this. If you look at the seed, you put it in the soil. The seed has life in itself. But when it's in the soil, the effect of the soil in, on the seed is to break down that outer shell, as it were, so that the life in the seed can come out. And when that life comes out, it takes root downwards, it bears fruit upwards, and nothing can stop you. Why? Because the life has not been exposed to come out. It does, there's, a, there's a process there. And it's that process I call the death, burial, and resurrection process. And that's what everybody will need to go through. How does that apply in your life? Very simply, to do what the Word says. Anytime you take any scripture and you want to do it, something will die. Something will die. I mean, it's, it's, I could tell you from the life of Moses, from the life of Joseph, and you could see it. The Joseph, the Bible says, I, I think I heard from another preacher, he said it this way, he said that God, when Jesus took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it, then he gave it. I like that. He took it, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it. It looks to me like that's a process right there. He takes it, he blessed it. You know, Joseph was taken and blessed. His father loved him. <laughs> and then he was broken through Potiphar's life and Potiphar's wife's experience before he was given to become the one who will lead the posterity and save the posterity of the Jews. Moses was taken. He was raised in Potiphar's house, in Pharaoh's house. He was blessed. 
He didn't do anything to just to, to, to win that blessing. But when he was taken, he was blessed. Then he was broken before he could be given to serve God's purposes. So, but I'm losing the principle of death, burial, and resurrection. And I'm saying it doesn't have to be your whole history. Just know it in your mind that that is how it works. And when you are taken and you're put in the seed, in the soil, Things will happen that will kill certain things in you. It don't, you don't have to do anything. The easiest example would be husband and wives. Husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? He laid down his life. Wives, submit unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. How would you do that? By laying down your life. So both parties have Christ as example for headship and for submission because Christ submitted to Christ, God, the Father, and you and we are his body. So he laid down his life for us in submission to God, the Father. So we have an example in one being one person called Christ. The husband can do that. So what the point is this, is the death, burial, and resurrection. Now, when you understand that, what it does to you simply is that you're no longer going to be looking for your own selfish ends or hidden agenda. It will deliver you from all of that. Why? Because every time you talk about death, burial, and resurrection, it takes God to raise the dead. You can't raise yourself. So what that means is that you're surrendering yourself to God and his will for your life, and then he raises you up. So if your husband loves his wife as Christ loved the church, his pride will die. Some things will die in him. But when he has done it with the right focus and the right motive, then God will raise him up in a sense the wife will begin to see a man that she can respect. And when a wife does the same, the wife will be shocked that the husband will not want to take advantage of her, if anything. He will see in her a woman that deserves to be honored and to be loved, according to 1 Peter chapter 3. So what I'm trying to let us see here is this, that yes, Christ died on the cross, but there's so much more. He was buried, yes. First of all, divine exchange. So we celebrate that. That's called 30-fold. We celebrate divine exchange. Wow, I'm a new creature in Christ. All things have passed away. Amen. Then we now celebrate the fact that that is also a pattern, not just the actual reality of his death. Because I'm not going to die his death again. I'm not going to carry his cross again. And then I'm not going to be buried where he was buried. But I'm going to have to carry my cross. I'm going to have to deny myself. And I'm out to go do his will. Jesus actually said that in Matthew 6. If anyone will follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Now, that's what I call divine, divine exchange, divine pardon. Now, you need to understand that because every time you take on doing what the word of God says, that process is automatically put in place. If you're going to forgive somebody, your, your willingness to retaliate will have to die. If you're going to give, your willingness to be selfish will have to die. Whatever you are going to do, if it is in obedience to the word of God, something has to die. And when you embrace that, it's no longer painful because you've accepted it. It's like a mother going to have a baby and she goes through labor pains. The same mother won't have another baby very soon. Why? She's accepted that labor pains are part and parcel of how babies come to life. So why didn't you accept the fact that death, burial, and resurrection is part and parcel of how you're going to grow into sonship? That's the way it works. And the third man, the third uh, uh, the definition of how Christ, why Christ came, or the third aspect of it, has to do with the manifestation of the sons of God through the love of God. You say, well, how does that work? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. One of the things that I've found out is that no matter how far and how long we've been with God, we still haven't comprehended his love the way we should. Because if you look at divine exchange, love is what motivated it. If you look at divine pattern, love is what motivated it. Because what is it that is dying in your life? It's the thing that will hinder your destiny. The thing that will hinder you from fulfilling what God has ordained for you. That's what's dying. So the thing needs to die, really, if you think about it. Because you want to fulfill destiny, you want to fulfill purpose. So that thing dies. Your pride, your insecurity, your fears, and all those other things that the enemy can use to hold you back, they die. Now that you've been through second phase, the third phase is manifestation. Whereby out of the love of God, you want to give expression to God's nature, God's character, God's power in your life because you love God. And listen, when you are in that state of loving God and you've come to the place where you are ready for manifestation, you know what the Bible says? That the Spirit of God, um, the, uh, the whole of creation in Romans 8 is waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. So God wants to manifest himself through you. 
But how will he do it if you don't go through the first phase, second phase? Now it's in the that phase you manifest. You lay hands on the sick, they recover, and you look, and like Peter. You say, why look on us and see by our own holiness who made this man whole? But faith in the name of Jesus has made him whole. And that gives you the confidence that you are an on course with God. So if you can take on these three levels of the reason why he came, I can say for certainty that you have laid the foundation for why Christ came and what he has come to do in your life. Now with that foundation, I'm quick to let you know this, that you have a purpose to fulfill. That foundation is there. It's going to be worked out in different ways in your life and nobody can predict how it's going to be worked out in your peculiar situation. But one thing is sure, that because God has a purpose for your life to be fulfilled, there are things in your soul, because listen to this, it will help you to understand that your nature, your nurture, and your culture have defined who you are. And if you don't confront those effects of those things in your life, you won't make the progress you should make. As a lot of Christians can be frustrated today because they don't understand, they have a secular, sacred divide. What do I mean by that? They look at themselves as, I'm a professional on a career, you know, but I have a sacred life. You know, so the pastors are the ones who do the spiritual things. I do the carnal things. No, that's not the way to think. You have only one life. Your life is as well sacred and has secular pursuits. But if you're not careful, the secular will take the time away from the sacred. So this mentoring process is to help both pastors, individuals, anyone who comes on this website or this broadcast to appreciate that there are some things that have been lodged in my soul, like laziness. Laziness in itself is not a sin. <laughs> it's not a sin to be lazy. It's just that you want to achieve as much as you could because you're lazy. So how do you overcome laziness? How do you overcome time wasting? How do you overcome lack of goals? So in themselves, these things are not dealing with sin, but I've laid that foundation for you in Christ so you appreciate what God has done for you in Christ. So now, now whatever we talk about is for you to do with the mind of honoring God who created you and put the potentials in you. You should understand that God gave you potentials. You know, the way I put it is this, that if you go to the Garden of Eden, there were no chairs and beds in the Garden of Eden, but there were trees. So that means that when God was creating those trees, he had in mind that with the participation of the human race, he can create, chairs can be created. So God is a creator. He creates something out of nothing. We are co-creators. We create something out of what has been created. So if you understand that, because God is also omnipotent, he has potentials in every way. There's so many things God does. In fact, there's nothing God created that doesn't have potential. Think about it. Every part of your life is full of potential. Look at the athletes for uh, um, Olympics. The potentials that are in human beings, is it the swimming, is it the running, is it the long distance or the speed, the sprint? Not to think about the potential in our minds, not to think about the potential in our spirits. So we are loaded with potentials. And if we do not conduct our lives in such a way that our potentials can be, first of all, discovered, secondly, developed, then they cannot be deployed for maximum use. And you see, God is not the one who determines how much of your potential is developed. No, what God simply does is that he has a program, he has a plan, he has a purpose, he puts the potential in you. He expects you to wake up, discover the potentials, develop the potentials and move on. So if you are willing to do that, then we can work with you in this mentoring series. And that's part of what this mentoring is about. It is simply about the discipline the development of relevant skills, harnessing of potentials, and this is what this mentoring is about. And I want to challenge you. It's not enough to know that, hey, Jesus died for me. It's not enough to know that, hey, I'm going to heaven when I die. It's not enough to know that, well, I belong to a local church. All of these are important. But what are you doing with the potentials that God has put in you? The potentials are so deep and so big. And you need to make a discovery of some of those potentials. And you need to make a discovery how to develop them. And you need to make a discovery how to deploy them to engage. You see, whatever God has put in you is to better the lot of other people. Take that on board straight away. Somebody else needs to benefit from your potentials. When you think about it, I mean, the tree is not sleeping on a bed. We are the ones taking the advantage of what the tree has to offer to create beds and chairs and what have you. You know what I'm saying? So everything that God has invested is loaded with potential. And let me tell you what, in our next series, we're looking at the stewardship of potentials.
so you don't want to miss that one because we want to now steward our potentials for the glory of god and enable us to fulfill first of all discover then fulfill until i come your way next time let me just pray with you right now father thank you for my listeners we pray that each person will fulfill destiny in the name of jesus thank you lord in jesus name amen Thank you.